Hey everyone, it's Norm Farrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the e-commerce and Amazon FBA podcast. Okay, today we're going to be talking about how to master Amazon's ecosystem. What matters the most on Amazon? What should a brand or seller think about when doing business or communicating with Amazon? And what should I do if something goes wrong? This is going to be a great one. So welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the e-commerce and Amazon FBA podcast. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. We got an awesome guest today. First time on the uh, podcast. Uh, been trying to get him on for a while, and I'm so happy that he's here. Well, first of all, get this. So he was the chief merchant and GM for multiple categories over on uh, Amazon in the U.S. and over in Japan for over 10 years. So you think he knows what he talks about You know, when he's talking about Amazon? I think so. His teams ranged in the size of 100 plus and oversaw 3.5 billion with a B. Uh, and since leaving Amazon, he operates as an independent consultant advising brands and sellers on their e-commerce strategy and helping with brand or problem resolution. His clients range from 1 million to 2 billion in annual sales, not bad. And we are going to be uh, welcoming Stan Friedlander. So I can't wait. Stan, I know you're in the back room and you're listening, but I've been trying to get you on this podcast for a while. So I'm so glad we had the chance today. Have you got as far as you can using automated tools to manage your advertising, but know that there's so much more you could be doing? Maybe you don't know where to start or how to improve your Amazon advertising. Why not talk to Clear Ads, an Amazon certified partner with over five years of experience in moving beyond automation campaigns to sophisticated and proven advertising approaches that are far more effective for larger scale Amazon sellers. Clear Ads prides itself on being an extension of your business, providing insights into how to achieve results and ensures that you are able to understand the approaches taken and how they work for your business. Talk to Clear Ads today and let them know you heard about them on the Lunch with Norm podcast and get a free audit and see how Clear Ads can work with you to build your business today. There we go. All right, where is the boy Blunder? That's me. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, if you guys are watching, this is a pre record. So, although we aren't live technically, I am in the background uh, of this pre recording, watching it live with you guys. So, we are still having a giveaway. Um, so, we will be announcing what exactly that is. So, everything is as usual as our live episodes. But um, yeah, we'll just cut in. Um, we'll announce the giveaway, and the giveaway is still good to go at the end of the episode today. So stick around. Also, if you have questions or comments, um, we're going to be adding it to our Facebook group, and we'll uh, send those questions over to Stan um, to see if he can help us out with any of the responses, if you have anything specific for him. Um, and yeah, before we get started, make sure we smash those like buttons. Give us a thumbs up. Also, check out our Facebook group. That's the Lunch with Norm. Amazon FBA and e-commerce podcast or collective. That's where all the fun happens. And uh, you can get to be part of the community. We have giveaways, discounts. We've got um, an engaged audience and uh, community over there. So if you have any questions, comments about um, how to sell success successfully on Amazon or your e-commerce business, you can throw them over there. Me and Norm are there checking it out. Um, and it's a great place just to get to know everyone. Um, because if you see any comments or questions come in, you can guarantee they're also in the Facebook group as well. So check it out. Links are in the description. And I think that's it. Okay. It's so weird. I'm looking over in the comments section, welcoming people, but there's nobody there. <laughs> I got to get used to these pre records. Anyway, anyway, if you do have questions or comments, throw them over into the uh, comment section. We will do our best to answer everything that comes in. So now it's just time to sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and in welcome Stan. Stan the man, yeah. how are you, sir? 
I am very good. I'm very good. And uh, thanks for having me. I know it has been a while since I've been, been a while, in, um, but I, I appreciate it. I'm glad we get, I got to figure it out. You know, um, I, I got a, an invitation uh, to speak at a virtual summit next week. And you're the guy with the keynote. Um, I believe Ecom, I am. Yeah, I, yeah <laughs> I, I may be talking about similar sorts of things as to what we're going over uh, today. It seems to be a common theme on uh, yeah. sort of how to think like Amazon or maybe think like a, I guess I'm an ex-Amazonian, so think like uh, an ex-Amazonian, I guess. <laughs> so, you know what? This, this is so timely. So, hey, uh, Kelsey's at the house right now. So we had Thanksgiving this weekend. So uh, my kids stuck around. So Hayden and Kelsey are across the room from one another. Hayden's working on a product launch that we launched last week. And um, sure enough, we've had to run through a few glitches. Uh, <laughs> we, this, this is just, you know, for the listeners, it happens. And you, you have to be resilient when you're working with Amazon. Doesn't mean you have to quit. It just means you okay done this problem i know how to fix it done this problem you know and you know you have to know when to hire an expert but right now just to give you a couple of thoughts we've registered two brands uh, um, under this one company uh, that are both ours they're both brand registered both trademark yet somebody has a similar name <laughs> and every time we upload a flat file Guess whose name comes up? Not ours. So take a guess. Then we get that straightened up. Then we go to do our store because we want to do all these Amazon posts and get them out there um, for the fourth quarter. Can't create a store because they're saying somebody else owns our trademark that we've provided all the information with, but still can't give us and that's today so you know just some frustrating things so i talked to somebody over at amazon they're trying to help us out but it's it's not something that's just going to be resolved overnight but these are things that happen on a regular basis unfortunately <laughs> yes they do so you know one of the things that like right off the top we were talking about or the way that i was introducing uh, today's podcast was you know what matters most over at amazon well, uh, I know that a lot of folks just assume, oh, it's this big, large conglomerate and they just want to make money. And, and yeah. quite frankly, I'm not going to deny that um, either myself when I was there or the people that are there leading the company wouldn't prefer to make more money. I mean, they are in the business to make money. But at the end of the day, I, I do still believe that that Bezos is uh, sort of isms, if you want to have such a thing, or his leadership principles the, the thing that does matter most to most people that are there, and, I, and when I say most people, I mean higher ups, is thinking in terms of how is this impacting the customer? And then once you start with a customer and work backward from a customer, then it, it, it may kind of reframe how you look at this particular problem. And when you look at this customer, rather than you say you as a seller or you as a brand, thinking of it as that's my customer and how do I think of this customer? I, I'd sort of reframe that I because Amazon's not going to look at it as your customer. Amazon's mm -hmm. going to look at it as an Amazon customer. Right. Okay. And so as a brand or a seller is that's where my starting point would be is looking at it from Amazon's point of view that this is an Amazon customer happening to buy potentially your product. And so when you have a problem or if you have a problem, but as you mentioned, it can usually be a when, but let's just say if and when you have a problem, thinking about it from a standpoint of what's important to Amazon is the Amazon customer and how is this problem being viewed by that person? That is how an executive at Amazon is looking at any detail level problem. And then they're summing this up is how many of those particular problems could exist. If this is happening to this one brand and this one customer with this brand, is it possible this could be happening in a lot of different places? So in other words, when you're explaining, say you file a contact us or something, 
the more that you can point out that I know this is not just affecting me, it's affecting your customer, meaning Amazon, and it's affecting your customer with XYZ problem that could exist well beyond just my brand. In other words, you've just made this problem a scalable issue within the Amazon ecosystem. Mm. This is how Amazon looks at things because they don't want to just solve sort of a whack-a-mole type of thing. They want to solve a process that hits from a scalable solution. And so that's how I would look at most anything is that Amazon is going to start from the customer and work backward. And they're going to look at this is that if this is just a, a one-off affecting this particular brand and this particular customer, it must be this, I'm just telling you, this is, it must be the brand or seller's fault on how they did something. But if you can see it from the point of view of how could this potentially impact so many other people, other brands and sellers, and potentially then impact, uh, have a negative customer experience to Amazon's customers, you'll, you'll be more likely to get them to listen. So that's how you have to yeah. think in terms of what's important and also starting to get into how you think in terms of communicating. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I'll hear, it'll come up and it's like I shake my head because it's not the truth. I do have a love hate relationship with Amazon, <laughs> but they are not going out of their way to hurt me. And, you know, oh, Amazon's doing this. They, they're trying to cut my sales there. No, no. I, I And, you know, I'd like you to address that. Like, do you think that somewhere they're trying to do that? Look, can I explain for every CS agent that may <laughs> no? I mean, look, they have, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's over a million Amazon employees worldwide. I think it's over that number now. Wow. Can Amazon genuinely control all 1 million people? Uh, no. Um, do they have processes in place to, to try to have you know, guardrails and all of this. Yes, they do. But one of the things to think about is Amazon also allows its customer service agents to essentially solve the problem right there. Like if you as a customer get on the phone, which I know Amazon tries to avoid, but let's mm -hmm. say you do get on the phone and actually speak to a CS agent, that CS agent is empowered to solve your problem. They can give away the $10. They can give away the shipping. They can give, in other words, you present a problem and for the most part, Amazon will just want to solve the problem. That is why they have the number one customer service ranking in not only the U.S., but most countries in which they do business right. in, a, in any large company, country. And therefore, no, they don't have. And by the way, I don't mean to be mean to any brand or seller in particular. You're probably too. I mean, you'll even say, I know I'm too small to care. Well, quite frankly, the reverse is true, too. If you're too small to care, then they're not going to bother to do something negatively on purpose just to harm you. Now, does that mean that you have a question and you would love just to either pick up a phone or email someone and have that just dialogue one on one with someone and have it immediately solved? You know, yes, I could see where people would want to do that. Um, will Amazon do that? Not likely. So that's where this whole thing of how do you build scalable solutions from an Amazon perspective, as well as how do you communicate in an Amazon manner such that you do get what you want? One of the things, this is a tip for any uh, who is having an issue. So there's a lot of good, there's a lot of okay, and there's a lot of bad Amazon customer service people out there. What for me anyways, I, I just, we, we tell our team, we never want to hear anybody get upset, scream, yell, call names. It's not going to help your, your cause. If the person, and this is, this is a policy in the company, this is an SOP in the company that if the person can't help you out and you know that they can't help you out, just tell them you got a delivery at the door and hang up. And so, you know, you're not hurting anybody's feelings. But what we found is that when we do find that exceptional person, we put all the or all the questions into a document that, you know, we, we compile. And if we find some good, I don't mind asking four or five questions. And if they can answer them, great. Uh, we've, we've had it where 
we've tried to solve problems and tried to solve problems and we could never do it. And then all of a sudden this person came on. I remember this person from Costa Rica just was incredible and just wanted to stay on the line, which that's another thing. Oh, Amazon has a quota. They can only stay on the line with you for three minutes and then they have to push you off. You know, it, I've been on the phone with them for a long time trying to resolve issues. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that or if you have any tips about, you know, how you can get to a better customer service person. Um, get, you know, the tips to getting to a particular person or a better person, that's a little difficult. Um, you know, yeah. but one thing that I will say is that this person likely has a job for a reason, and that is to help customers solve their problems. And they are doing so for a company that way back in, in its DNA and in almost anything that they do, does genuinely want to please customers. And I'll admit at one time, they may have viewed brands and sellers as a customer as well. And that may not be quite as, as true anymore. And that's why I focused and started with by saying just the end use customer focus on what does the end use customer want in any particular situation, whether it's a question, a problem I have, a suppression, a, you know, whatever it is, what, how am I, how am I helping Amazon solve from a customer's um, perspective? So if you're talking to a customer service agent and your starting point is this person won't help me, my guess is they won't because they're human too. Mm -hmm. So if your starting point is that, well, actually Amazon's better at this than most people and your approach is from that standpoint, then you're, you're light years ahead of where you would be because they are a human too. And you are probably dealing with someone, no offense to this, this particular person, they're not the highest level person in the company, but this person likely is empowered to solve your problem or they at least know they can escalate it fairly quickly to someone who may know the answer. And if you then start yelling at this person or you start threatening this person, and then you're going to get to, well, geez, I do have quotas or whatnot. <laughs> right. So I would argue you're probably right. They do have quotas. So why, why piss this person off or waste their time and give them the perception that this person, I'm not, this person's wasting my time. They're right. going to want to get off the call. Yep, exactly. So just, I, I'm kind of uh, interested to hear your standpoint on this. Uh, if you're a seller and you're trying to communicate, now we just touched on a few things. Are there any ways that we can communicate better with Amazon so we can get further or get the answers quicker? Mm, I mean, I, in general, and even this is with me and I may, you know, let's not kid ourselves. I may know people, I mean, yeah. I may know people, you know, within an Amazon and um, that is admittedly some of what I do and do help people with. But does that mean in every instance, especially someone who's maybe not doing a lot of volume on Amazon says, oh, they have to go hire someone like me. I mean, I look, I'm, I'm, I recognize, look, the cost benefit of that may not be the best. Um, the, the best thing, and I say this even to large players is, you have to at least create a case. You have to have an ID. You have to have a claim ID. You have to have that in place, even for me to then say, oh, this looks pretty bad. And I agree with you. Um, and you do, this is, this actually could impact other people. Um, I know the head of this department or I can at least find out or whatever, but if you don't have a case ID, I'm gonna tell you, I can't do anything with it until you do. Because even the director, or even the VP of that, they can't, they can't look it up. They don't know how to look it up, quite frankly, unless they have a case or a claim or a ticket number of some kind, because everything is logged at Amazon. And so the first and foremost thing to do is to do a contact us, even if that's very rudimentary and you're, you know, you probably are going to be speaking to a fairly low, lower level denominator. But this is also where I say, in that question, in that case that you're filing, you right there, you're creating communication with Amazon. And if you communicate pissed off, <laughs> yeah. it's likely not going to go very far. Right. right? Strangely. Uh, but if you communicate in the way that this is impacting customers and don't call them your customers, 
call them Amazon's customers that you're trying to serve and you know you have served with X amount of sales, with X amount of sale, seller rating and X amount of account health, like prove with numbers why you are you have done well with this in the past or how you want to get better. You know what your reviews are yeah, like I always want to try to use as much data as I can, even if it's the first communication you're sending them and you're saying this person doesn't care. You know what? Yes, they do. They want they want to solve customer problems. That's their job. You know, and if they don't want to, Amazon will figure a different job for them. No, no, that's that's great. So the first thing. So anybody who's listening right now, the first thing to do is just create that case. And then I love what you're saying about, you know, thinking about it's not your customer, it's Amazon's customer. So, so many, so many people don't think about that. And I don't really, I've never really thought about it that way. You know, so it, it's interesting to hear you say that because uh, I, I am customer centric. Like I always think about the customer journey or the experience and I try to look at it that way, but I've never spun it to take a look at the Amazon experience, they even explain it that way. So that, that's a, that's a cool tip. Now, the other area that I want to talk about is sort of what are you seeing? What are some of the issues that are coming up right now um, in the fourth quarter? I, well, I, I will say is that you're, you're potentially seeing um, capa capacity related or demand forecasting related issues. You may not be able to send in the units that you would think you should be able to send in or that, that you, you see a certain amount of order demand, but what Amazon's requesting from you seems to not be matching up. Um, and that could be both good and bad. In some cases, it could be that Amazon's maybe ordering more than you thought they would. I would argue what I'm seeing more of is that it's less and hence why you, somebody finds me. Um, but I would say that's one issue. I would say um, to a certain extent on the brand side, um, raising prices, you know, we've been dealing with inflation for probably you know, 12 to maybe 18 months now. And so you're almost anniversarying on top of what was you know, rising, rising prices last year at the same time. And so on the, even on the brand side where you may be wanting to increase your cost to Amazon, Amazon may be pushing back on that or may not be responding. I am seeing, you know, more of things like that. Um, I would also just say is that uh, uh, the competition, not so much just from a price because that's existed for quite some time, um, but the competition for um surfacing higher and therefore how much smarter you have to be about which terms you want to bid on and how you think through the whole ppc network um that's just i i would just say is that's becoming increasingly not just more important but increasingly more competitive and i i happen to be a, a believer that well that does tend to benefit amazon because people are then bidding more um, so you have to just be very smart and judicious. Don't just think that the terms that worked for you last Q4 are the same terms you should be doing now or the same bid amounts. I try to, first of all, I focus on organic search. I mean, get your detail page right from the get-go yeah. um, and get your content as right as possible from the get-go. But once you're at this bidding stage, keep looking at it. I mean, the whole dialing up and dialing down and waiting for Amazon to tell you what to do, please don't, um, you know, get smart at this or use someone um, to get smart at this. Uh, learn right. from that, that person you use and then maybe, you know, I hate to say this to the network, but then learn how to do it yourself. Um, see, I always try to argue for my own obsolescence, if that means anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I... Uh you mentioned about uh you know the listing optimization getting that that straight first i just got a way out there question for you everybody that comes on has a different answer so i'd love to hear what you have to say about this in the title long short keywords engagement what do you do what do you recommend um 
Well, I do try and, and keep in mind, my background is actually in fashion where, uh, not to be snooty, but I, our, air, our category is almost snooty from the get-go in the sense that um, using the right terms or using certain terms that are cute or whatever. And I try to, all, whenever I was meeting with brands and, and, and or sellers and trying to give them some advice to think about is that I have never had a customer that searched for a midnight sweater. I have never had a, a customer search for a salmon sweater over a pink sweater or a pink dress. In other words, the keep it simple, stupid really applies to search. Mm. On the flip side, we all, you know, many of us, sorry if, you know, if we're English as first language, but, you know, as second language, I've actually found English as second language are sometimes the, the smartest people about how they're putting together their search ranking because they don't think from a grant, a grammatical standpoint. In other words, prepositions don't help in search. But when we write an essay that we were taught, say, in high school or college, how to write an essay, you think in terms of write the, you know, the and an and a and all of these, none of those help. But in search, search doesn't care. Search doesn't care about grammar. Search doesn't care if you repeated a word, especially if that word's important to consumers. So that's my long-winded way of saying, actually, your product titles should include as much as what's relevant to that particular style and don't over include things that don't matter. If you're selling a shoe and I ran the shoe business, shoes is the number one search term on Amazon. I don't think I'm saying anything that's not public, but is that helpful? If I'm selling a $200 women's stiletto, you know, um, fashion shoe, I'm not going to say brands, but is it helpful for me to say, oh yeah, put shoes three times in the product title? Absolutely not. That's not going to help at all. Um, uh, you know, and, and you might get yourself in trouble with the Amazon police. Probably not. They're not going to catch this stuff. But what does matter is what matters to that particular shoe. Should you use pump? Should you use stiletto? Should If I'm selling Levi's 501s, do I need to make sure the Levi 501 is in the title? You're damn right you do. Um, if I'm selling something that's competing with Levi's 501s, do I put Levi's or 501s in the product title or in my description? No, that's the quickest way to get your item suppressed. Um, so there's some smart things to be thinking about, but there's also dumb things. You know, you may want to put, I'm not going to, you know, Amazon will probably get me in trouble by saying you could put that in the generic keyword, in the hidden keyword field, and that might help you. But only if it's something that genuinely a customer might want when they search for that term. If it's just something, uh, I'm diesel gene, so does putting gas in my title help me? No. Just because you're selling decent jeans, it doesn't help you at all. Uh, it has to be relevant to your particular product. Um, but I would think in terms of if you're selling an item that happens to be a tool of some kind and think of all the different use cases for your particular tool, even use cases that you think are stupid, which could be like the people like me who don't know how to fix anything. I might search for that item that way. So think in terms of all of those things. And yes, I would put them in the product title and I wouldn't worry about the grammar that ties each, you know, you're just seeing term, 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 and none of them tie to each other. Well, those are the items that surface higher in search. Perfect. All right. So I would like to talk to the listeners, although this is pre-recorded, if you do have questions about, you know, anything that's come up over the last uh, year or so, over the last few months, you know, what did you do? Did you get it resolved? Uh, and if you did, how did you do it? So just please put any of your comments or your questions over in the comment section. We'll get to them before the end of the show. Or if we don't get to them because it's pre-recorded, uh, we will definitely get you the answers. Um, we have a giveaway today. Awesome giveaway today from Stan. Do you want to just talk a little bit about it? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I would offer up a free evaluation, um, meaning if you find, you know, find me, reach out to me or whatever, and um, I, you tell me about a case or you tell me about your company and whatnot, I can certainly spend some time with you. Um, we'll say it's up to an hour. Uh, I'm spending some time with you of just what your particular issue may be. Um, I'm not going to deny 
does that mean that in an hour I can solve your problems? I, I hate to say in, in general, no, uh, but I'll certainly as best as I can go, go over with it, go over with you about the problem, about how I might think about solving it. Uh, and in many cases, especially if it's a big hairy problem, say on Amazon or some of its competitors, because I do that as well, um, it may be, okay, this is who I would think about reaching out to, or this is how I would think about communicating, or it may also be, this is how I would think about, say, uh, strategizing internally at your own, you know, your own company, but then actually executing on any of that may take some more time. But I'll certainly, you know, ha you know, offer up uh, uh, how to evaluate where we're headed. Well, that's awesome. So if you're interested in spending 30 minutes, an hour with Stan, uh, it's hashtag Willa Kelsey and tag two people and you get a second entry. So that's an awesome giveaway. Uh, so I guess before we get to the next segment, we've got a word from our sponsor. A big thank you to our sponsor, Post Purchase Pro, the only complete A to Z done for you real email and text marketing service built specifically for Amazon sellers. My friends, Sean Hart and Seth Stevens co-founded Post Purchase Pro after launching over a thousand successful private labeled products, growing 53 brands and get this exiting 17 businesses. Post Purchase Pro creates all of your digital assets 100% for you from marketing inserts, complete sales funnels, email follow-up sequences, and weekly email promotions. They manage and optimize everything for you to drive more sales, get higher ranking, and receive more reviews on Amazon. So check out Post Purchase Pro now to see if you too will see enormous growth like their nearly 500 clients worldwide. That's Post Purchase Pro at postpurchasepro.com slash lunch. Okay. Post Purchase Pro, if I didn't say it again. <laughs> anyway, one of, the, one of the questions that constantly happens every holiday it's about copyright infringement are we still seeing that um i i would say yes and no what i i would argue and as much as i i get it kind of goes back to you know you thinking that amazon's against you i would actually argue that amazon does do a fairly good job of trying to be a filter you know, yes, they do want to have as much selection as possible. And yes, selection does get on their site that, uh, you know, isn't necessarily what it, it you know, it purports to be. Um, but they do have filters to start generating something that so it goes to a human so that a human should evaluate it. And, and you know, simple things could be like, are there two reviews on the same item that say the word fake or say the word duplicate? And so would that item then cause someone internally to have to look at it and then verify, okay, is this person, is this real? Is it copying? Is, you know, is there an issue here? Um, but am I necessarily seeing more of that today than I did say a year, two years, three years ago? No, I wouldn't say so. Um, what I would argue that I'm, I'm seeing I don't know if it's more of, but is sites that are actually small sites that say have niche businesses that compete against Amazon or say with Amazon um, that don't have those filters. They don't have the cash flow that Amazon clearly has. And so they may not have an infrastructure that is set up to do the evaluation. And so in those instances, those marketplaces it is a bit, even though people think of Amazon as the wild west, I would argue actually some of these other sites are much more of that than you might realize. Okay. That's where I'm seeing the copyright issues. Right, right. So the, um, uh, I wanted to talk to you just briefly about another question that comes up and that is leading traffic away from Amazon. So as soon as you hear that, it's like you cringe because you can't do that. But we've been talking quite a bit about inserts. What is allowed on an insert? What's not allowed on an insert? So people are using QR codes and they're driving traffic over to their web page. So what we've been saying to people is that's 100% legit if you're providing a warranty or warranty registration, something along those lines. 
if you're driving away traffic to go to the site to buy product, then I think that's a problem. Am I correct? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's a problem. And I'm not going to deny that internally, it's not like uh, you, you don't have most employees. And mind you, I'm talking in the retail business, um, it, that most people on the retail side, when you describe the situation of you're driving the customer away, say to your own site, it, it I mean, you know, like I did, I, I twinge and I don't even work there anymore. So, um, but that isn't to say, but you're right. If it's providing a service, if you're providing, um, you know, I can think of you bought a, I mean, I, I ran watches in Japan at one time. And, and if you're uh, providing a service where I knew I wasn't repairing that watch, I couldn't as an Amazon, I tried to figure out how we could have a return center and we would repair and send it back to you. And I couldn't figure it out. But if that seller has a capability of adding, adding a service, but still allows me to sell it on Amazon and they don't, you know, there's not something explicit that says, you know, come to our site and, and, and we'll help you with repairing and we'll think it will help you with the warranty that's better explained or whatever. I might still question, well, why isn't it better explained on the site, meaning Amazon site? Why isn't this, should we be thinking about how we have a partnership of, do I send them an email that says where they can get this done? You know, I'm still going to look at it as to how can I control the customer experience. So I, I'm going to give you that as it's not breaking the rules as long as you are offering a service that Amazon doesn't offer. But be careful because could Amazon offer it? And are you the one that's going to do it with them or for them? Or are you just giving them the idea of how they figure out how to offer it? And then suddenly you have competition on Amazon. You know, so I would think through that. But and yes, you always should be careful of sending yeah. somebody off the site because the immediate question internal at Amazon is no. Right. You can't do that. Mind you, they've started this buy with Prime, which is another whole, you know, service offering that Amazon is is looking at, which arguably is helping D to C grow their own platform with Amazon offering up a, you know, their shipping capabilities, let's say, but on you purchasing on somebody else's platform. So in other words, Amazon is looking at this of, they're not a hundred percent against the, you know, somebody, they recognize the other world does exist off their site. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at that for one of our, the, the products that we launched last week on Shopify and <laughs> It's against Shopify's TOS to have that button on your page. Kind of, kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, it didn't on day one. I think yeah. Shopify, Shopify realized. I mean, I, I, I mean, I deal with both, not directly, but I obviously have, I have clients on both uh, Shopify and Amazon. <laughs> and when, when say people ask me about Shopify, I would just say, well if Amazon ever chose to offer what Shopify offers, because Amazon could already do it. I could have built someone's platform. I could have offered the shipping and whatnot. We just didn't choose to because right. back in the day of never sending somebody off the, the platform. But I think Amazon's kind of moving beyond that. And when you see a company that's in the multi-billion themselves, which is Shopify, you start wondering, well, maybe we should get over ourselves. Yeah. And I think that's where Amazon is. And Shopify's response was, well, not on our site. But Amazon can still offer. Amazon could at some point just turn on something that says we're just going to become Shopify. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. And it was shot down right away, which was too bad because I really <laughs> wanted to do that. The, the yeah. other I, give, I give Shopify credit for that response. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing that uh, I looked at, and going back to um, just going back to uh, inserts, is that this is a kind of a hidden one as well. Uh, if you send over somebody to your site, and you're giving something away for free, or if you're giving fifty percent off, I've heard uh, that's an ins if they come back and they buy it, that's incentivized, and. I, I know there was a huge scandal uh, with supplements. Uh, I think it was about two years ago 
because that that was viewed as an incentivized um uh i don't know if they called it incentivized or a manipulation of rank but um if you were to do that here's your coupon code you go over you get 50 percent off you get a freebie what are your thoughts on that um well i admit if i was still running the the footwear or i'd probably be pretty damn against it <laughs> yeah okay all right <laughs> I, I would i would figure out a way within whatever is within our contract with that particular seller of really reading through um the various sort of pricing equity offer equity uh, i mean it, it, look let's not kid ourselves amazon also has to be careful of becoming the you know the the uh, monopolistic uh, approach but at the same time if I'm giving you the traffic on my site, then do you notice how I just called it? If I'm an Amazon employee, I view it as my site. Yep. I've got even, you know, going back to the other conversation, I've met with some pretty large footwear brands. And anytime they start talking about an Adidas customer, a Nike customer, I keep thinking, I think, aren't we talking about Amazon? You know, I get it that yes, they came to Amazon to buy your product, but they came meet to me first. Um, so just, I'm just giving that that's how the typical business leader thinks internally to Amazon is that it is their customer first. So if you came to their site and you have an insert of some kind that is driving some sort of incentive, whether it's reviews or whatever, which don't do, but whether it's something that has them go somewhere else and there's an incentive attached, you always run the risk that Amazon says, congratulations, this is now an incentive that's offered on our site. We really appreciate it. Right. I don't think it would be that condescending, but it, it could be. Okay. So I would just, I would be careful of like, okay, we're willing to offer it at 50% off or buy one, get one 50 on our site. Are you willing to offer that on Amazon if Amazon made you? And if you didn't, Amazon kicked you off. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not saying that they necessarily would do that, but it's likely within their contract that they could say they're allowed to match price. Right, right. So I guess, like, especially because of your background, I'd really, and we've talked about a few of them right now, but if there's any other points that you could bring up from Amazon's standpoint, what gets under their skin? Um manipulation with their platform as much as i know that uh we'll, we'll call them good sellers mm -hmm. uh <laughs> operating within the rules that they know uh are, are on amazon um strangely it may feel like oh amazon just allows everything and so you know actually that's not true i mean internally um it's how do we have how do we have processes that solve problems, catch bad actors, let's say, but do so in a legal framework where we also are, our, our, our number one mission is Earth's largest selection. So you have these sort of balancing acts of, well, Amazon could have huge filters and make it very difficult to launch product. Or they could make it relatively simple to launch product, which then obviously means that is there copying or is there reviews manipulation and things like that? There could be. The, the easier you make something to enter into the ecosystem, the likelihood is, is that you have some form of bad actors, right? Um, but I would still say that internally, that does bother them. Whether they solve it quickly or whether everyone at all levels is bothered equally, that I might dispute. Um, and I would say, no, I don't think customer service agents are out there to get you. I may argue if you're paying someone $15 an hour, do they genuinely care? They may not. And so, you know, you pointing out, hey, this seller X is buying my product and putting bad reviews on my site, that customer service agent, I mean, do, how much do they care? Well, if you can prove you're right, but you better you better have all your ducks in a row before you just pick up a phone and or, you know, and, or even email and you're just losing it in the email, because in reality you better be able to prove it. And that I admit that's hard to prove, but once it's proven, 
Yeah, Amazon, because it doesn't help him. It doesn't help Amazon to show up in a newspaper article uh, or a blog somewhere and have someone criticize that they bought a counterfeit item or that they easily were able to post negative reviews on somebody else and it wasn't a verified purchaser. It was from actually a competitor. Is that possible for it to happen? Of course it is. Is it possible for someone to offer an insert where um, the next uh, purchase, they're actually paying you to have it leave a five-star review? They could do it. How long it takes for Amazon to catch it? You know, that's anyone's best guess. But does a Amazon want to solve those problems? Yes. And internally at a higher level, I do genuinely believe that they want to solve those problems, but they want to solve them in a process way, not like, oh, that seller really sucks, let's kick them off. They wanna find out, well, how did that happen in the first place? And the more that you can give them all the details of how that may have happened in the first place, the more it helps them solve a process problem. And do not expect that Amazon's gonna then respond to you and say, oh, thank God that you did this for me. We really appreciate it. Now, you're probably never gonna hear from Amazon again because that's a legal issue if they start talking about what you helped them with. Mm. So. You have to keep that in mind as well, is that you complaining about something that's, you know, you're being negatively impacted or, or you see this nefarious activity, you presenting it, what you care about is that that nefarious activity went away. You're not going to hear from Amazon that thank you. And you're likely not going to say, I'm sorry, hear them say, I'm sorry, a customer service agent. Yeah, I don't think that. you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. And one of the other things that happens when you hear these you know, wide sweeping maneuvers where all of a sudden a bunch of people, like pesticide, for example, you know, it was, it was just, it, tons of people were affected by it. I was affected by it. Um, there was a reason for it. And all of a sudden you might have another reason where you get, you might hear 10,000 sellers were automatically suspended or all of a sudden they clamp down on something. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the times it, it's, it's a legal issue. You That's know, right. they're, they're having problems with a, a battle and either they lost or they better shut whatever window that is. Is that That's correct? Right. Yes. I mean, you, you have to, again, the starting point is look at it from Amazon's perspective. And yes, they're a business and they sell to however many hundreds of million and there's, you know, well over a hundred million prime customers. I'm not giving you anyway, any details because I'm not giving the specific, but like we all know that there's that many prime customers in the U S worldwide, you know, it's well more than that. It matters because people focus on when there's a problem on Amazon. And so if Amazon's response is, well, they did find out about pesticides and we're going to really look into this. And then they went one by one by one by one to make sure of which seller was doing it right and which seller was doing it wrong. Well, in that meantime, which that could take weeks, you're still selling some bad product, right? But you're Amazon. That opens them up to a huge amount of liability because people care. They care that Amazon should be perfect. And mm -hmm. so when they're not perfect, Amazon has to respond with, get this off the site now. And then start adding back, oh, this looks right. This looks right. This looks okay. And you may need to prove it. And you may, you may see, well, wait, competitor A of mine, they're already back on the site, whereas I'm still arguing. Well, I might say maybe they wrote it more from, they wrote their case more from an Amazon perspective. And they, you know, they, they presented it with data and they explained how this is impacting customers. And, and the data could also be speaking to, here's the compliance that we go through. Please tell us, you know, from here's the US standard, here's the UK standard here. We, this is what we do in every instance and give them every last detail, even if they didn't ask for it. And you're more likely to get your product relisted. If you just say, we comply, and file a contact us, that's going to go nowhere. Right. Your word for something is meaningless to Amazon. And one of you the getting, things you getting sued versus Amazon getting sued is a little, you know, it's a little bit, bit bigger deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Uh, one of the things that we tried to do, uh, and this is in our company, but uh, it's risk evaluation. So if we knew something was coming up or somebody on the team found out something, they would do like you're saying, this is how you need to approach it. So if it's, if it's getting the information, what information are they going to need? If it's compliance, what are the compliance documents? Where to go for them? And these are all little things that save a lot of time and they save a lot of frustration too. So, and then there's minor things. So again, this is a, this is breaking TOS, but there's a lot of people that do this images. So you've got this image that's not necessarily the image of the product with a white background. It's an image with a person holding a baby carrier or whatever it is with, you know, the sun in the background. That's against TOS. You might get suppressed. You're not going to get suspended. Okay. How do you get rid of that? I mean, these are minor things, but these are, these are links that anybody in your team can submit and you can just replace it. So it just helps as you're building up your company or as you're building up your brand. If you, if you come across these things, if you battle it once, well, you know, it could be a repeatable offense. So you want to make sure that you know how to handle it. Um, I don't know if you do anything like that, but it's very important for us. No, I mean, I am typically not the person that is doing the, 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 the initial contact us or whatnot, I usually get involved because you've, you've been denied mm -hmm. and then you tried again and you've been denied. You talk to someone and they said, well, actually I heard about this person Stan and he may be able to help. Um, usually that's how people find me is that it's, they're kind of at their last, you know, their last, uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, that all being said is, you know, it's kind of goes back to me saying file a contact us. Um, be careful about being quick with anything because once you file a contact us and it's denied, there's a denial on record. So that means that the next one has to override an internal employee, even if it's the same level or even if it's a higher level, which takes an extra level of courage <laughs> that oh, you're saying that person was wrong or we didn't get the right data and that makes it easier for you to override the previous person's decision. But if you think you're, I mean, it's kind of like the definition of insanity. If you're going to file a contact us and then just basically yell louder and think that that's going to get the contact us reversed. No, it won't. absolutely not. You know, right. so when you first file that, have your ducks in a row and be very detailed and very um, formulaic in how you communicate. And, and communicate from an Amazon perspective and without, as I, I kind of joke, is we're not allowed to use adjectives and whatnot inside the company. So don't use a lot of superlatives and adjectives and whatnot in the way you're described. We're a great company. Amazon doesn't care. <laughs> What's the problem? Just tell yeah. them the problem and tell right. them why it should be solved. And don't add all the sort of fluffy language. <laughs> right. Yeah, I love that. Anyways, I think that's it. I I think that's it. You've been released. I hope <laughs> I hope you like today's uh, today's show, Stan. I mean, it was just so easy to talk to you and, and get this information, and it's important information. Uh, you know, for for the listeners, if you do have questions, please or comments, put them over in the comments section. Re-listen to this because what Stan was saying throughout are these, I don't like using this word, but they're little nuggets. They're, these are helpful to get where you want to go. And at the end of the day, if you can't do it, talk to a person like Stan. And I still got to get all your com, uh, contact information. We're going to be uh, going over to the Wheel of Kelsey in a second. So uh, Stan's going to be, Stan's um, giving away an audit or it's a 30 minute to one hour consult. And if you're interested in that, it's hashtag Wheel of Kelsey, tag two people, and you'll get a second entry. So while we're waiting for that, uh, Stan, how do people get a hold of you? 
Uh, probably best way, it, I mean, I, I am on LinkedIn um, and my name, I think is fairly uncommon, but uh, that's one way. And probably the best way is just uh, through email. And it's just my last name, first name at gmail.com. So friedlanderstan at gmail.com spelled exactly how you see it on the screen. Perfect. All right. So before we get into the wheel, Kels, can we have our last sponsorship spot? I want to give a quick shout out to an incredible group of sponsors who help keep our podcast running. The Lunch with Norm podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of the following sponsors. Post Purchase Pro, Clear Ads, Goldstein Patent Law, Hone Worldwide, Netfluence.co, Video Telepathy, Startup Club, and Dragonfish Brand Management. I just want to let our sponsors know you're awesome. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, Mr. Kels. Yes. All right. So you know what time that is. It is the Wheel of Kelsey. Uh, we'll play the song and uh, we'll cut into the live winner um, after this. So here we go. It's time for the Wheel of Kelsey. Hey everyone, this is the sub-producer of the people, Hayden here, uh, who will be running the wheel of Kelsey on behalf of Kelsey, who is currently flying somewhere over the US. Uh, so let's see if I can hook this up correctly. Nope, not that button. Just give me one second. Okay, so we have the wheel here. Thanks for entering everyone. Uh, Let's see who the winner is. All right, congrats, Connor. We'll be reaching out shortly uh, regarding the consultation, the hour long consultation with Stan. Um, all right, that's enough of me and I'll queue up the rest of the episode. Thanks everyone. All right, so with Congrats. some fancy, yes, congratulations. With some fancy <laughs> editing, we'll know who the winner is. And uh, yeah, make sure you email us at k at lunchwithnorm.com if you are today's winner. So congratulations to whoever you are in the future. But uh, I think that's it. And Okay. Um, yeah. So Stan, if you could just hold back for a, a couple of minutes, uh, we're going to remove you right now, and then uh, we'll talk to you in a second. But thank you so much for coming on. I I hope it doesn't take a couple years, but you know maybe we can get you back on and talk about it a bit more. Amazon. No, awesome, and thank you for having me. Much. It was awesome. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So I hope you like today's uh, episode. Uh, very informative. It's something that you should go through not once, but probably twice and not on double speed. Um, Kels, what do you got to say? All right. You guys know the drill. Make sure you smash those like buttons if you haven't already. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's Norman Farrar. Or if you search up Lunch with Norm, you'll be able to find all the episodes. And uh, don't forget to join our Facebook group as well. That's where our community is. If you want to um, meet the other uh, Beard Nation members, you can go here. That's Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA, and e-commerce collective. So uh, check it out, join it, and uh, you can talk to me and Norm through there and ask your questions, get advice from the experts, or uh, give us your feedback on episodes, uh, topics, whatever you'd like. So great place to be. Check it out. And that's it. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining today. Uh, we're live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, most most of the time. Anyways, it's awesome to have you here. We have an awesome community, and thank you so much for being part of our community because we really couldn't do this without you. So have a great day.